Attorney General. Welcome to your Catholic Drive Time. Keeping you informed and inspired. We love God. We ought to be able to talk about Him. Getting you started on your day. With the latest in breaking news and information. From the Vatican to the White House and everything in between. It's serious. It's fun. It's your Catholic Drive Time. And welcome to Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. Today is Thursday, September 21st, 2023. The Feast of St. Ephigenia who was a princess. St. Ephigenia was born in the first century as a princess in the royal house of Ethiopia. She was Ethiopian by birth and a pagan by birth, and the entire culture of Ethiopia was steeped in paganism. But it was St. Matthew the Evangelist who arrived in Ethiopia, and he began to evangelize the, evangelizing the people, converting many to the Catholic faith. St. Ephigenia was inspired by St. Matthew's words, and she converted to the Catholic faith and sought to consecrate herself to Almighty God. Now, St. Matthew would then later invest her with the veil, and she became a leader of a group of around 200 virgins who also wished to consecrate themselves to God. This became a proto-religious order that happened in Ethiopia. Now, King Hertakis was a newly reigning king. He desired to have St. Ephigenia as his spouse, but she refused, saying that she was married to Almighty God. Now, he sought the apostle St. Matthew to help to persuade her. And it's kind of interesting to think in the first century, we're seeing a king and all of his subjects attending Holy Mass and who was the presider, who was the priest for the Mass? It was St. Matthew. And so St. Matthew, the next day, delivered a sermon on the nobility of marriage. And King Hertakis was then very encouraged, thinking, oh, St. Matthew, he's setting it up. He's setting up the situation. He's going to tell He's going to tell her, yeah, look how great marriage is. Nobility of marriage is so wonderful. Therefore... 
you should go and get married. But unexpectedly, he then stopped and emphasized the wrongness of stealing someone else's spouse. And he said, then that St. Ephigenia was married to God. And so if it's wrong to steal someone's spouse and if in a worldly sense, how much more to steal the spouse of God? Now, King Hertakis was then angered by St. Matthew's words, so much so that he sent a swordsman to slay the apostle, who was then martyred while kneeling before the altar. Now, King Hertakis ordered St. Ephigenia's convent to be burned to the ground as an act of revenge. But she prayed to St. Matthew for help, and the apostle intervened, causing the flames to turn against the royal palace, burning it all to the ground. And devotion to St. Ephigenia still exists today in places of the Portuguese Empire, and such as Brazil, and is considered the patron saint of African descent Catholics in Brazil. A very interesting thing. So what happened to the to St. Ephigenia and what happened to King Hertakis? Well, King Hertakis and he ended up committing suicide, and his brother ended up being possessed by a devil. St. Ephigenia ended up dying peacefully in her old age. And so St. Ephigenia, pray, pray for, for us. us. Uh, good morning to you, Rudy Carlos. Good morning, Adrian. This story, it gives me a little bit of hope for you. Maybe maybe I can be your co-pilot. Be my you know, co-pilot. In, in, my, in my desire to be a saint, mm. I will be your saintly co-pilot. And maybe, can you imagine having... St. Matthew as a co-pilot. Like That's pretty he, dope. He's he's trying to he's trying to be your wingman. I think wingman is the actual yeah uh, the yeah, actual wingman. word there. Imagine having a saint being your wingman. Yeah. So you have St. Matthew as your wingman. And he's like, yeah, she's uh, gonna go be a nun. So <laughs> 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 so good luck. Go find someone else, dude. Yeah. Look, man. Um, she's taken. By she's God, taken, bro. <laughs> it's like, well, who is he? I'm gonna fight him. Um, <laughs> his name is God. What does he have that I don't have? everything (laughs) so there you go yeah so if people who are like man i don't know uh my my daughter's too good for these men um well if you think that then uh, maybe you should send her off to a convent based yeah there you go that's what i'm gonna do there you go (laughs) that's what i say about my sisters i'm like why don't you just go join a convent yeah god's god's better uh at 15 past the hour we're gonna talk about apple have you seen the apple commercial uh rudy was telling me Yeah, the Granny Smith one? Are we talking about Fuji apples? No, 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 no. Are we talking about... We're talking about the one you were telling me the other day. You're <laughs> like, you're like, dude. Um, <laughs> anyway, we'll talk about it at 15 past the hour. We'll save that conversation at 15 past the hour. At 30 past the hour, Bishop Strickland has given us an update on his situation um, from his own pen. So we're going to be reading that at 30 past the hour. At 45 past the hour, San Francisco is recruiting police in Texas after hmm. pushing to fund the police. So we'll talk about that at 45 past the hour. Very interesting they're doing that. Alan Smith is going to be joining us in the next hour to give us a recap on his parish missions. And speaking of parish missions, I did not give a parish mission, but yesterday I was at St. John Vianney in Houston, Texas with the St. Anne Society, and they uh, I gave a talk there, and it was went really well. So praise be to God. So prayers for the St. Anne Society. And also, i got to say, that's the coolest mom's group I've ever seen in my life. Like they had tons of people and like a million events, like a million events going on. They had so much support. They were like, had a, half the women there were pregnant. The other half had newborns. And it was uh, really impressive. I, I was kind of um, unexpected. I didn't know what I was going to expect, but it was not the amount of, it was, like, it was so well organized too. I, I've never seen a mom's group so well organized, so many events. Very impressed. Very impressed. So, uh, Wait, praise be to God, to St. Anne Society at St. John Vianney. And, of course, we have our Fear and Trembling Game Show coming up, so be ready to call in. But let's begin in prayer. I'm going to be praying for your intentions, whatever it is you have going on in your life. I pray especially for the healing of my grandfather's cancer. I'm praying for whatever, uh, for Emily Esserman's liver, that, uh, that they figure out what's wrong with her, and they are able to solve that problem. And for our friends, family, benefactors, and all those we promise to pray for, for the salvation of souls and liberty and exaltation of Holy Mother Church. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. O Blessed Virgin Mary, Immaculate Mother of God, who didst endure a martyrdom of love and grief, beholding the sufferings and sorrows of Jesus, thou didst cooperate in the benefit of my redemption by thy innumerable afflictions, and by offering to the Eternal Father his only begotten Son, 
as a holocaust and victim of propitiation for my sins. I thank thee for the unspeakable love which led thee to deprive thyself of the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, true God and true man, to save me, a sinner. O oh, make use of the unfailing intercession of thy sorrows with the Father and the Son, that I may steadfastly amend my life and never again crucify my loving Redeemer by new sins. Arid that, persevering till death in his grace, I may obtain eternal life through the merits of his cross and passion. Mother of love, of sorrow, and of mercy, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. And now, your headline news with Rudy Carlos. Good morning. You're listening to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. Here are some of today's breaking news and stories for you. Two-thirds of Americans have little to no confidence in po the political system, according to a poll. Only 4% of those surveyed in a new poll by the Pew Research Center believe that the political system is working extremely or very well, while 63% express little to no confidence in the future of U.S. politics. In terms of the two political parties, 86% of the U.S. adults say that Republicans and Democrats are more focused on fighting each other rather than solving problems. And 85% of those who were, survey, who were surveyed said special interest groups and lobbyists have too much influence over politics. Large majorities also blame the high costs needed to run a campaign for making it difficult for good people to run for office. And Merrick Garland loses it as Congressman grills him over FBI spying on traditional Catholics. U.S. Representative Jeff Van Drew from New Jersey had a tense confrontation with U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland on Wednesday concerning the Biden administration's Department of Justice's treatment of traditional Catholics as, quote, violent extremists, unquote. Take a look at the exchange. Attorney General, through the chair, I ask you, do you agree that traditional Catholics are violent extremists? Answer I have no question. idea what your what the traditional uh, means here. The Catholics, idea, let me Catholics just, that go I to church. Your, may I answer your question? Yes, the idea no. that someone with my family background would discriminate against any religion is so outrageous, Mr. so absurd. Mr. Attorney General, it was your FBI your that did this. It was your FBI that was sending, and we have the memos, we have the emails, we're sending undercover agents into Catholic churches. Both I and the director this of the FBI the have said that we were the appalled. FBI have said that we were appalled by that memo. So then you agree the that they're not extremists? We were appalled by that memo. Are they extremists or not, Attorney General? I think that... Are they extremists or not, Attorney everything General? Everything in that memo is Are appalling. they extremists or not? I'm asking a simple question. Say no if you think that was wrong. Catholics are not extremists. No. Was anyone fired for drafting and circulating the anti-Catholic memo? You have in front of you the inspection of divisions, investigations. Tell me yes or no, please. I don't know. We have the no answer. time. I don't know the answer to that. There okay. Is a Do you agree that parents process. attending? Continuing the stories here, we have the Ohio Supreme Court maintains most ballot language in abortion referendum. The decision upholds most of the language in the proposed abortion rights measure, but ordered a rewrite of some terminology it said was misleading to voters. It did, however, per permit the references to, quote, unborn children, unquote, with which a pro-abortion group had not taken issue. The group had contested five other linguistic choices in the measure, with the court only ordering the rewrite of one. Now, those were some of your headlines this morning, but stay tuned on Catholic Drive Time for more. Back to you, Adrian. Thank you, Rudy, for keeping us up to date. The Gospel today comes from Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. Uh, today is also the feast of St. Matthew, considering that this is uh, St. Aphigenia and St. Matthew are linked very closely. And the Gospel today is the calling of St. Matthew. Now, I did want to read to you this. St. Bridget had a vision of what was it was like, what Matthew's experience was like. And this is what Matthew told her. St. Matthew told St. Bridget, It was my desire at the time. I was a publican to defraud no man, and I wished to find out a way by which I might abandon that employment and cleave to God alone with my whole heart. When therefore he who loved me, even Jesus Christ, was preaching, his call was a flame of fire in my heart, and so sweet were his words unto my taste that I thought no more of riches than of straws. Yea, it was delightful to me to weep for joy, that my God had deigned to call one of such small account, and so great a sinner as I to his grace. And as I clave unto my Lord, 
His burning words became fixed in my heart, and day and night I fed upon them by meditation as upon sweetest food. End quote. This is very telling. Because how many people kind of see St. Matthew as this wicked sinner who wanted to defraud men, who wanted to steal money, who was a horrible usurer, and that our Lord just came by and said, this is Matthew, come and follow me, and he drops everything and follows him. That kind of is what we kind of foresee it as. And some people will accuse Matthew and say, oh, yes, these, some of these apostles, they were very foolish because they heard someone call them and they just dropped everything and went. They were very naive. No, this is not the case. And this is not the case for any sinner. We have to have within our hearts at least a desire to abandon our sin. We have to set our hearts on something that will abandon our past lives. And then God will act. Then God will step in and call us to a greater life. But first, we have to have that desire. It's not enough. It's not enough to simply live our lives and pretend and think God's going to just intervene and God's going to step in and, and save the day because God desires that we participate in our salvation. He will move us. He will give us that first act of faith, hope, and charity. He'll put those movements, those theological virtues. He'll give us a little taste of those theological virtues. And then we are to then take those virtues which our Lord has planted within us and stir up in us this devotion, stir up in us this hatred for sin, this hatred for our past lives. And then and only then, God will come to us and call us to a more perfect life. And then we can think no more of riches than of straws. Then we can pray that a fire be lit within our souls and that the words of our Lord become sweet as honey. And then we can cleave unto our Lord. Let's pray that God give us his virtue today. Let's pray that God give us a hatred for our sins, that God give us a rejection of our past lives, and that he give us the grace to embrace the life of heaven, to embrace a repentance of sins, and a grace to follow our vocation. Let's pray for that today. When we come back, speaking of sins, we're going to be talking about Apple and their pagan worship. We'll be right back with more right after this. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Minute. Have you ever heard someone say, the Catholic Church would be okay if it weren't for all the rituals? Why do people complain about rituals in the church? They don't complain about the rituals that fill the rest of their daily lives. They shake hands, they sign their names, they put candles on birthday cakes, they give each other flowers, they put on fancy weddings and somber funerals. Those are all rituals. They are symbols. They are simple ways of representing complex ideas. G.K. Chesterton says, ritual is a need of the human soul. In fact, it's a need of the human body, like exercise. Destroy your impressive ceremony, and all you get in return is unimpressive ceremony. Want more than a minute? Visit our website at chesterton.org. Hey, Donnie, what are the two most important things we receive at Mass? Ah, the Christmas scripture. That's right. All right, one more. Who loves you the most? Jesus. That's right. Mary. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they love us too. If you don't educate your children in the faith, who will? Educate yourself and your family by listening daily to the Guadalupe Radio Network. And make sure to get the GRN app by logging online to grnonline.com. And welcome back to Catholic Drive Time Show. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. It's so good to be on with you today. Praise be to God. Before we jump into this whole Apple story, I did want to mention Rudy's uh, clip there was cracking me up. I was laughing my head off. He was like, you would accuse me of religious discrimination? It's like, dude, yeah, that's ex that's literally what I'm doing right now. Like, the FBI? The question. <laughs> the FBI. You would say the, the FBI would, would it be spying on U.S. citizens? No. Never. 
<laughs> I, I was dying. I was like, this guy, um, is he serious? Like, is pretty, he joking? pretty sure there's many cases where that's been documented. That we, <laughs> that's it's been officially released, we know. At the very least, at the very, very least, I was absolutely mind blown. He's like, are, are we spying on traditional Catholics? I don't know what that means. What, what do you mean by that? What do you mean, traditional? It's it's like, just Catholics go to church. <laughs> uh, you know, right. it's... Uh, I. I hesitate to report stuff like that because, you know, oftentimes it's just theater. But uh, this is this is important. This is one of the the stories that actually affects Catholics. The the government is literally spying on Catholics. It's time that, that we had a realization. There's something wrong here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think uh, many people we kind of just bury our heads in the sand and pretend that that's not happening. And uh, until one day someone gets arrested, right? And then what what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? So we definitely want to make sure we keep an eye on those stories. And I'm glad that people are actually bringing it up. And it's kind of funny to me hearing uh, the phrase traditional Catholics said on the Senate floor. <laughs> That's kind of amusing to me. Uh, but anyway, all right, let's see. Let's talk about this clip from Apple. There is a, this whole series of clips. We'll go through it slowly and um, analyze different parts of it because different parts of it, I was – uh, it was pretty. It was pretty strange that they decided to do this. And Rudy pointed out to me, and I didn't even notice this. They disabled the comments on it. They they, they le- released it and didn't allow people to comment on it, which is pretty telling of what they thought about what was going to be how they um, how it was going to be perceived. So uh, let's play that clip. We'll play clip one. Welcome to Apple. Welcome to Apple. Hi, I'm Tim. How is the weather coming in? Hi, I'm Tim. I'm going to do the offices already carbon neutral thing, right? Yeah, all yours. Yeah, so you see it opens up, and they are all uh, scrambling about. And also, you also notice that the entire board of Apple, according to this video, is incredibly diverse. You have black people, white people, Hispanic people, uh, women. You have people who are obese. You have people. uh, It's the most diverse group ever. But then you look at the actual makeup of Apple's board, and it's not that. (laughs) So they just they just fabricated a a fake board for their for their video here to make it more seem more diverse. And it's also funny to see how because they're saying okay, they're they're ready. They're getting ready for a really really important uh, guest to come and talk to them. Who is going to be addressing the board of Apple? It has everybody freaking out, everybody scrambling. Who could it be? Uh, let's play clip two. I hope we didn't keep you waiting. Mother Nature. Mother Nature, welcome to Apple. How, how is the weather getting in? The weather was however I wanted it to be. That was let's cut to the chase. In 2020, you promised to bring Apple's entire carbon footprint to zero by 2030. Henry David Thoreau over here said we have a profound opportunity to build a more sustainable future for the planet we share. I think our 10 o'clock said the same thing. They all do. All right. This is my third corporate responsibility gig today, so who wants to disappoint me first? Yeah, so... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the the Mm. line that gets me was, uh, this is my third one today. Like, it actually, and it's honestly very telling because they're basically telling you, yeah, this ESG stuff, this whole environmental stuff, is so prevalent. It's It's, coordinated. It's coordinated, and it's at every single company. They're addressing the every single company. We're all got to get behind it. We're all going to be addressing this. and um, And the biggest companies in the world are bowing down to it. Like it's pretty telling how how blatant they were just going to tell us, yeah, we we literally are just doing whatever the environment wants, whatever that means. Um not to mention they anthropomorphize the environment, mother nature, and they make it very dramatic and they're like, "Oh yeah, mother nature showing up." You know what they used to call um those uh whenever mother nature would appear to people? They call them druids. They'd have a uh, nymphs They'd have uh, these uh, these pagan uh, these pagan deities like an avatar, like an avatar. Hmm. Yeah, these uh, these pagan deities, these uh, these tree nymphs, these animals that would uh, manifest as as human beings, but they're actually uh, plants and animals and things like that. Very strange that they're that they're kind of promoting this idea. But here's a uh, clip three. This is also very interesting. We're also phasing out leather in our iPhone cases. What about Brando over there? They phasing you out too? Yeah, so uh. that part I I wanted to play because 
what is they pushing here? Anti-leather. Anti, they, they're pushing this idea that we got to stop uh, killing animals because uh, killing animals is yucky. We don't want, we don't want to do that. But I mean, Rudy will tell you leather is superior. <laughs> it lasts forever. It lasts forever. It's it's literally the most perfect, uh, you know, it's the most perfect material. Um, and considering, you know, that the the process, I think if you, there's obviously room for improvement, right? Uh, when we talk about the, the slaughter and use of animals. Right. Like there was a reason why the Native Americans would use almost every single part of the animal, including the hide. It's because the animal had a lot to provide for you as a, you know, a consumer. Now, yeah, you know, maybe there's uh, industry practices that aren't very good. I can't speak to those, but I'm sure they're there. Uh, but to get rid of something wholesale, it also reminds us that they want to get rid of you eating cows in the first place. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the 2030 agendas is to uh, remove our dependence on beef because they see that the cows, they're producing too much methane. They're producing too much climate change. Uh, so really uh, kind of a kind of insane, uh, an insane tie-in to this uh, Apple commercial. Yeah, we'll play clip four now. Lands in Kenya. Why? Our aim is to permanently remove carbon from the atmosphere. Yeah. What about your wife? Yeah. <laughs> they literally said that. They said to permanently remove all carbon from the atmosphere. Well, there goes all the plants. There goes all life. <laughs> like that, that's it. Like... They, I, I'm not sure if this is just a, a mistake or are they just admitting to us that they want to kill everybody? Because if there's zero carbon in the atmosphere, we will all be dead. We do. We need carbon in the atmosphere. I think that's why they disabled the comments. I think that's why they disabled the comments. <laughs> and it's, it's, I, I was absolutely mind blown when they, I, read, I heard that. I was like, wait a second. That's not right. That, and I reheard it like three times. It's like, no, they straight up said they want to get rid of all carbon in the atmosphere. You literally could not have life. You, they, they are endorsing the slaughter of all human life or all life for the sake of the environment. You know, I, I say this. I say this ironically, but not really. This is one of those kind of I'm joking, but not. Mm-hmm. Um, if there's more carbon in the atmosphere, I mean, look at the uh, if we're we're to believe science, right? And every d- jot and tittle of science. Um, there was megaflora and megafauna when the climate was different. When there was a lot of uh, carbon and, and different, different things in the atmosphere, the plants were bigger. Isn't that beneficial to us? Wouldn't we want bigger flora and fauna? You know what's also interesting, as a side note, is the, uh, the increase of carbon in the atmosphere. People, scientists are talking about how they can uh, harvest the carbon and make... Um, diamonds. Not, not the diamonds, no, but... They and I'm forgetting what it is now. It's like the this material that is um, that is post, post, supposedly like incredibly strong, incredibly conductive. It has many many uses that they can basically funnel it and use it for other things. And the point I'm, I'm not I'm not trying to like talk about this product because I don't know anything much about it. My point simply is that human ingenuity will solve these problems. Mm. I mean, we are so creative and so intelligent as human beings that we will find a way to be able to clean that up and be able to use it in a effective way. I mean, like for instance, the main reason why we can't really do um, salinate, uh, desalinate water, the seawater is because we have energy problems. Why do we have energy problems? Because we won't use nuclear because we won't use nuclear power, things that we've already invented. We already created. So we will solve the problems if we just allowed us to do the solving and not hampered it. Uh, so I think it's a, that's very interesting, but we'll play the next clip. As you can see, we've innovated and retooled almost every part of our process to reduce our impact on the planet. But there's still a lot more work to do. And there's something else we wanted to share with you. You're not trying to bribe Mother Nature with apple swag. <laughs> it's apple. Yeah, so what they did here is they're basically saying, that, oh, yeah, we're going to reduce our carbon footprint. We're going to use recycled material. We're going to be doing all these different things. And I just have to point out that they care more about the environment than they do about the employees, their workers. Uh, Rudy was telling me this thing about with the Chinese factories that I didn't know about. You mentioned oh, about Oh, yes. Them. This was an older story. Uh, Foxconn, I believe, used to be the major manufacturer for some of the Apple products. And the conditions there were horrendous for the people who were assembling these products. 
So much so that a lot of them wanted to take their lives and did. And so what did the company do? Did they improve the working conditions there? No. They added nets so that people wouldn't die from falling off, uh, from jumping off the, uh, the upper stories. And then they started uh, you know, moving their production elsewhere. Wow. They would move them out in different, different companies and things like that. But this was in China. And so by, by make, using recycled material and all these other things, they reduced the cost for themselves by making the packaging smaller and able to transport more in, in a one single ship. They reduced the cost for themselves by um, doing the work in Chinese factories or doing, reducing the cost for themselves. The whole thing sounds to me like a giant uh, ploy to be able to lower the cost for themselves while making it sound like they're being virtuous. And it's pure virtue signaling. Uh, we'll play the next clip. I want to see you do more of this. You will. When? By 2030, all Apple devices will have a net zero climate impact. All of them? All of them. They better. They will. Or else. Or else. Yeah, there you go. They're like, they, they better. Or else. Like, uh, are they better or what? Or what? Mother Nature's going to come and be angry at us? Or your crops. Did you see what I did to the Aztecs? I ruined their crops. Dude, I, it's, it, it's mind-blowing. Because they, they literally think that if they don't do this, Mother Nature is going to be mad at them. Mother Nature is <laughs> going to do something to them. Like, as if Mother Nature is a real thing that can actually uh, have a mind, have a, have a soul. There is, no, there is no such thing as Mother Nature. Only in an analogous way can we talk about that. And also, you did hear them admit to Agenda 2030. So mm. everyone talks about Agenda 2030 and they think it's a conspiracy theory, even though every company and every major government release official statements about it. And it's not... It's some hidden thing. It's out in the public, and yet people still think, oh, that's conspiracy theory. Uh, but let's play that last clip. Good. See you next year. <sighs> Don't disappoint your mother. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So there you go. They don't disappoint your mother, they say. Don't disappoint your mother. And they say, good, we'll be back next year. As And what do we see here? We see this pagan worship of Mother Earth and two... It's an admonition of the ESG. It's an admonition that these environmentalists control all these major companies. And so I think it's something that we have to keep in mind, something that we have to be aware of. Whenever we see these things, it's a massive mani media manipulation. The good news is most people are not buying it. Uh, when we come back, New York City residents are blocking migrants from entering the city. That's interesting. Have you heard about life coaching? Hi, this is Coach Felicity with your Stand Tall Today Coaching Minute. Coaching is one of the things Jesus did with his disciples. Whenever they were stuck, overwhelmed, or even struggling a bit, Jesus asked questions that brought clarity and hope. He then used ongoing conversations that helps them to navigate the path and completely change their lives. Just like the disciples, we too can find ourselves feeling stuck, overwhelmed, and struggling a bit. Maybe you need help in your marriage or with a parenting issue. You're navigating a loss, you want to improve your health, or advance your career. At StandTallToday.com, our experienced coaches will help you to take another look at life, renew your hope, get past those challenges, and step into living abundantly. You can find out more about coaching and schedule a free introductory call by visiting us at StandTallToday.com. Listen, life is too short to stay stuck. Contact us at StandTallToday.com. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We're currently cruising at 39,000 feet. We'll turn that seatbelt sign off for you and let you move about the cabin. Looks like we're about two hours and ten minutes from landing. Plenty of time for you to pray for vocations to the priesthood. Wouldn't it be great if everyone prayed daily for priestly vocations? Why not start today? A friendly suggestion from Guadalupe Radio Network. Hey, welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm Rudy Carlos, and here are more breaking news and headlines for you. The Shrine of Virgin of Flowers, whose name traveled to Mars with NASA, was desecrated. The assailants entered neatly, forcing open the grating on a sacristy window. From there, they entered the church where they desecrated the tabernacle and the image of the Virgin. In addition to leaving the consecrated hosts, our blessed Lord, that were reserved in the tabernacle scattered on the floor, the thieves took a shaborum, 
and the mantle of the Virgin of the Child Jesus that is part of the image of the Virgin of Flowers, which is kept in an alcove with tempered glass. Now, some collection boxes of the faithful deposit where the faithful deposit their alms were also broken into. The name of the Virgin of Flor Flores has gone beyond diocesan devotion in Malga in a particular way, as it was among the 150,000 references of life on Earth that were placed aboard NASA's Perseverance probe that was sent to Mars in 2020. Please pray in reparation for this desecration. And lastly, Michigan's top court won't revive Flint water charges against seven key figures. The Michigan Supreme Court rejected a last chance effort to revive criminal charges against seven people in the Flint water scandal, waving away an appeal by prosecutors who have desperately tried to get around a 2022 decision that gutted the cases. The Attorney General's office uh, used an unconventional tool, a one-judge grand jury, to hear evidence and return indictments against nine people, including former Governor Rick Snyder. But the Supreme Court last year said the process was unconstitutional and struck it down uh, and said the charges were invalid. Now, si since 2016, there's been a bipartisan effort to hold people criminally responsible for Flint's water disaster, but there have been no felony convictions or jail sentences. Seven people pleaded no contest to misdemeanors that were later scrubbed from the records. Now, those are all your headlines this morning. May God bless all of your holy efforts today. Thank you, Rudy, for keeping us up to date. You know, before I jump into it, there's a couple stories I want to see, but I just saw this story, and I think you'll really like this, Rudy. I just I think you'll really like Lay it. Lay it on me. So, the Flying Saucer Pie Company. Have you ever heard of them? Mm, no. Flying Saucer Pie Company. I don't know if it's a chain or not. It's really popular in Houston. It's a Houston. Really? I've yeah. never seen it before. Really? Yeah, they're really good pies. Uh, you should definitely go and get some. I highly recommend. They put out this post of a receipt, and it says, um, it, you see the receipt. Someone's bought a pie. It has subtotal, local tax, and then total, credit card sale, yada, yada. And it said, then they put out, hmm, this is what our receipt looks like. Do y'all notice anything missing? We have no tip option. Hmm. Why? Because it's our job to pay our staff, not our customers. <laughs> Coming from someone that waited tables in college and has been in service industry my entire life, tip culture has gotten way out of hand. Here at Flying Saucer Pies, we reject the idea that our customers are responsible for supplementing our payroll. Y'all have a great day, and don't forget to come by and see us. So there you go. Uh, praise be to God at Flying Saucer Pie Company. That's pretty. I'm honestly, I'm thinking about like just going to go get a pie just because of that now. Um, because there you go. There you go. I hate tip culture. I despise it with a passion. It's like the, one of the only things that I liked about being in Europe. Actually, there's a lot of things I like about being in Europe. But one of the things I liked about being in Europe was that no tipping. Just pay the more and charge me more. If you want to do, if you want me to do it, then just pay, make me pay more. And we'll settle out of that. Uh, but there, there you go. So hopefully other companies follow suit. And they had really good feedback. Like they had only two people dislike the dislike it. Now, if you like that story, I'm just going to flip the screen over here and you just right. uh, leave, uh, leave a, a gratuity there. I'm going to look away. Look away <laughs> while you do that. Oh, 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 oh only, okay, only, um, only wow. 15 cents. Oh, okay, mm. I see. Uh, I hate when they do that. That just drives me nuts. <laughs> Can you walk away at least? Yeah, they just stare at you like, so are you going to leave a tip? No, no. I'm not leaving a tip for you grabbing me a cup of coffee. Uh, gee whiz. So anyway, uh, that's a side note. I just saw that right now, and I was like, oh, I think Rudy would like that Major story. dub. Yeah, major dub. I love that story. Another quick story that I want to cover real quick is this clip eight here. New York City residents blocking migrants from entering the city. We'll play this, uh, this quick clip for you news on Staten Island. A large group of residents are blocking a bus that's carrying migrants. This is happening on Father Capadano Boulevard and Midland Avenue in Midland Beach. Several police units were called in to respond to the crowds blocking traffic. We are working to get more information from the police tonight. We'll bring you any updates as soon as we get them. Yeah, so that was a very quick clip. And the one thing that I thought was interesting as a side note as well, I mean, a lot of side notes today, is Father Capadano Street? That's Based. pretty cool. <laughs> That's pretty cool. But uh, this is very interesting. They, One of the people who, in the video, if you were able to see the video, one of the people was holding up a sign that said, socialism is the enemy of the free people. Only legal immigrants welcome. Hmm. And I thought that was very interesting. It's We're seeing more and more people in the North, in the Northeast, in the Midwest, and in California, even in the West, realizing 
illegal immigration is not the uh, the great boon that they think it is. It's not this great, wonderful thing. Um, and just like the sign the person holding the sign, I'm fine with legal immigrants. The problem is people who break our laws. I want our laws to be enforced. Is that too much to ask? I don't think so. I think it's a pretty pretty fair request to ask people. Now, finally, we'll get into the story I actually wanted to talk about. Those are just kind of side notes. Um, an update from Bishop Strickland on his apostolic visitation. Now, his this update, he released this letter. I was very, very encouraged by it. He says, Dear flock of the Diocese of Tyler. Now, I think it's funny because um, everybody and all faithful Catholics around uh, the United States are waiting on bated breath for Bishop Strickland's uh, statement. He's, uh, and he dresses his, his family in Tyler. He says, I realize you may have heard information about me that is concerning and possibly confusing. See, he, he's like, he's telling, uh, this, this is his what's concerning us section. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he said, I thought it would be good for you to hear directly from me. Hopefully, I can alleviate some concerns and clarify any confusion. As you probably know, there was an apostolic visitation the diocese conducted the week of June 19th to 24th. Bishop Kikinans, I don't know how to say his name, uh, retired from Tuscan in Arizona, and Bishop Sullivan from Camden, New Jersey, spent the net week interviewing various people about the condition of the diocese included by interviewing me. I have not heard from any church official from Rome since the visitation concluded on June 24th. I was not given a reason for the visitation, and I have not received any report since. I have said publicly that I cannot resign as Bishop of Tyler because that would be me abandoning the flock, and I was given charge by Pope Benedict XVI. I have also said that I will respect the authority of Pope Francis if he removes me from the office as Bishop of Tyler. Now, notice here, he's saying two things. I will not resign, but if they order me to leave, if they force me to leave, they fire me, basically, then I will obviously respect the authority and leave. And he goes on. Last week, an article was published on a website called The Pillar, and the article alleged that a meeting was held with Pope Francis where some of the members of the Congregation of Bishops recommended that I be encouraged to resign as Bishop of Tyler. Let me be clear that I have received no communication from Rome regarding this. At this point, it is simply an article discussing supposed leaked information from the Vatican. I have said publicly, and I just read that, I have also said that I respect the Pope Francis' authority. I, I love Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church, which he established. My only desire is to speak his truth and live God's will to the best of my ability. In closing, let me share my profound gratitude for the support and prayers that so many of you have expressed to me. I continue to love serving as your shepherd, and thankfully, during all of this time, I have been able to visit many of your parishes and celebrate our Catholic faith with you. I am blessed in my personal prayer in which I feel very close to the Lord and supported by the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints. Your prayers are a tremendous support as well. I am at peace with whatever the Lord calls me for, whatever the Lord's call for me is. Let us continue to pray for Pope Francis, the church, and the Diocese of Tyler that we call home. God bless you and all who are dear to me. Sincerely, in Christ's name, the Most Reverend Joseph Strickland, Bishop of Tyler. So thank you very much to His Excellency Bishop Strickland for addressing his flock in a very direct and clear way. And so he's very clearly, now we know, Bishop Strickland has not received any um, message from Rome personally, and that these are so far have not been substantiated as real a real thing that's happening. Uh, which tells me, and honestly, the pillar does a really good job at reporting. I have some issues with the pillar, uh, but they honestly do really great reporting. They they, they pretty much mostly uh, dot their eyes and cross their t's, and so I wouldn't. I'm not. I don't actually doubt that this is true. I think this is probably true of what the pillar is reporting. Here's what I think is going to be a result of this. I think that the backlash may end up working and they may end up doing nothing because they realize how many Americans, how many Catholics in America have stood up for Bishop Strickland. And if, and this is before anything has even happened. This is only when rumors have started to swirl. So how much more support and how much more backlash will Rome get if he's actually removed? And I think, I hope, and I pray, and I think that this will actually cause them to not take any action. 
and then many people will come back and report, see, this was unsubstantiated rumors, and this was never going to happen, they were never going to do this. Uh, I don't think so. I am fairly certain that the pillar reporting is accurate, and that this is definitely a real conversation that was happening, but that they are probably going to stand down and stand by for now. So let's pray for, let's take Bishop Strickland's advice, pray for Pope Francis, the church, and the Diocese of Tyler. We'll be right back with more right after this. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question if you're a non-Catholic friend. Was the Catholic Church in existence as far back as the first three centuries? Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, baseball. In September 1845, the New York Knickerbocker Baseball Club was formally established and called baseball. Rules were set, included a diamond-shaped infield, foul lines, and the three-strike rule. But seven years before that, in 1775, that game was already being played on schoolyards, well before it was ever called baseball. Secondly, the Apostolic Fathers such as Tertullian, Clement, St. Ignatius, all wrote before 215 A.D. about the authority of the local bishop, and they used the name the Catholic Church, which already had the liturgy, the Eucharist, the readings, the relics, a hierarchy, and jurisdiction. And thirdly, my take. To fishermen, a dolphin was just a big fish until they were termed dolphins, but they were always dolphins. And baseball was baseball well before it was termed baseball. And you will love this. The early church was the Catholic Church well before Constantine the Great, the Nicene Creed, and your church history book. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We're currently cruising at 39,000 feet. We'll turn that seatbelt sign off for you and let you move about the cabin. Looks like we're about two hours and ten minutes from landing. Plenty of time for you to say some prayers for the souls in purgatory. Wouldn't it be great if everyone prayed often for those in purgatory? Why not start today? A friendly suggestion from Guadalupe Radio Network. Welcome back to the Catholic Drive Time Show. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. It's so good to be on with you today. Praise be to God. You know, a story that I see, I'm, I'm surprisingly seeing more and more people talk about it. It's kind of funny. And not a funny in a ha-ha way, but more funny as in that's kind of strange. Because I was um, driving into work the other day, and I saw the giant billboard of uh, the surrogacy thing, and I talked about it on the show, and then that later that day... I started seeing people post about surrogacy, started people doing videos on surrogacy. And I was like, look, everyone listens to Catholic Drive Time Show. That's what it is. Uh, I, no, no, of course not. But I, I was honestly thinking, I was thinking, what's in the water right now that everybody is now readdressing the surrogacy thing? And this old video popped up that I wanted to play because it is a, it, it's very telling about the surrogacy, surrogacy issue. And I think that it's, um, it's something that many people have not really been aware of the situation. Like people think that the um, that the surrogacy problem is no big deal. They think that the surrogacy problem is, is something that is very is not is not the biggest issue. But I'm trying to say that this is a real issue. It's a real problem, and people are going to be able to see it when they realize. The way people talk about it, when you realize that these problems are are more serious because you just see the objectification of women when you see it. Uh, but I'll let you listen to it from these two sodomites. Uh, we'll play that clip. It's our beautiful egg donor. Um, so we wanted her to have lovely big eyes. I wanted her to have really thick hair because I've had two hair transplants. I wanted her to have a really wide, nice smile and just look like a kind person. Yeah, and we wanted her to be creative because we love the arts. Yeah. So how it works is you join up with the egg donor agency and you literally go through thousands. That's what Stuart did. That's what I did. I went through thousands, thousands, thousands. I shortlisted them, sent them to Francis and yeah. let him decide. And then we had, I had three or four in front of me and then we had a few Zoom calls with the ones that we liked. And then the yeah. first egg donor let us down. Fuming! So Second bad. egg donor let us down. Oh, yeah. Fuming. Fuming! And then by the third, we literally found her, and I was like, oh, she's incredible. And when we got on the Zoom call, we were like, oh be calm, God, play it so down, beautiful. don't be too keen. Um, and and luckily, she said yes, and this is the result. Yeah! He's looking at <laughs> So this is how. Yep, yep. So that's how the whole surrogacy thing works. And that's how it works. They get a magazine, they get a catalog, 
and they flip through the catalog and like, oh, she's kind of ugly. Mm, uh, she's uh, she's kind of pretty. I think I would want her to have have her my kid have her genes. Uh, maybe not. I don't like her nose. Uh, let's see. And then they come in. And they're like, oh, they interview him. Mm, she kind of has these bad habits. You know, I don't want my kid to have those habits. Uh, we'll pass. We'll pass. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of those slave auctions where they have like the slaves lined up. And they're like looking at them, like, oh, that slave, uh, he looks, uh, he looks strong. He could do some good work on the on the fields. And then you look at the other slave. He's like, oh, well, he's cheaper, but uh, he probably will probably get what ten years out of him. Uh, that's kind of the the feeling I got when I was listening to these sodomites talk about uh, buying a woman's a womb, renting a woman's womb, and then purchasing her baby. That that's what it sounds like to me. That's what it feels like. And it is absolutely tragic to see these uh, sodomites have that child now, this child who is going to be uh, abused and be like, oh, you don't know that. Well, I'm not saying that they're going to be physically abused. I don't know. I have no clue. I'm not saying they're going to be any that there's going to be any physical damage to them. I have no clue. But by being raised by sodomites, you're getting psychological abuse just necessarily because it's unnatural. It's disordered. Uh, two sodomites should not be allowed to raise children. This was not something that was ever allowed in the history of humanity, better yet, the church. This is something that is being forced upon us, and we see it in, in Europe and many uh, insurance plans in, in America. Uh, they, will, they, will do, they will give you a fertility treatment if you are infertile. And in, in, the, in England and Britain, if you are infertile for two years, if you can't conceive a child after quote-unquote unprotected sex for two years, then... The UK government will give you uh, fertility treatment. And obviously, one of the things they do is they'll pay for your IVF, which is bad, but we don't want to support that. But the idea here is that they have an issue. There's something wrong with them. And so the government has a vested interest in families. So they're going to subsidize you having kids. Sodomites uh, throughout Britain have been protesting and suing the government, saying that they are being um, discriminated against, that they should also receive fertility treatment. They're not infertile. They're just sodomites. You can't have kids. It's biologically impossible. That's not, that's not a fertility problem. There are real people with real fertility problems that are suffering who desire to have kids and they can't. And then these people who are just saying that they are owed children, they are owed kids because they want one, because they want to buy a kid and they can't afford one. So they're saying, hey, government, buy us a kid. Help us get a surrogate. Help us use IVF. You don't have a fertility problem. You're just sodomites, and sodomites can't have kids. That's simply biologically true. That's like getting mad because you planted a seed in concrete, and the concrete won't grow anything. And you're like, oh, this concrete is discriminating against the seed. No. It just doesn't do that. That's not how it works. This is very bad, and we need more and more people. I'm glad to see so many people out speaking out against surrogacy, but it's not enough. We need more and more people to be sounding the horn that this is bad, that this is very bad news, and it's going to get worse if we do not stand up and shut it down as soon as possible. We cannot allow it. We can't allow it for straight couples either. We can't allow it for heterosexuals, for normal people. And normal people should not be allowed to have surrogacy either, but it's even worse when it's sodomites. This is something that we have to ban outright, completely, and totally. Now, I wanted to move over to talk about this. San Francisco, speaking of, um, of gays, of sodomites, right? San Francisco, uh, recruiting cops in Texas after pushing to defund the police. This is a, always my concern. These leftist places like California, New York, Portland, Washington will destroy their areas, ruin their lives, and then instead of saying, instead of sitting in their, in their, and wallowing in their destruction, they come over to Texas, they come over to Florida, they come over to Tennessee, and they say, all right, y'all need to do it too. And then we're going to take the good things y'all have and bring it over here so we can then destroy it again. The San Francisco Standard reported that for the first time, police officer candidates will be tested outside of California with a written test, a physical ability test, and an oral interview. A department spokesperson said that the trips are meant to lower barriers to entry, uh, to entry into the police department, speeding up the hiring process. A side note, notice they said a department spokesperson. 
instead of a department spokesman. Isn't that weird? We're doing spokesperson instead of spokesman. It's always been spokesman, not spokesperson. Very, very disordered. The standard also goes on. It says recruitment push comes as SFPD faces staffing issues, leading the department to pay out millions in overtime annually. Between 2017 and 2022, they spent $88.9 million more on its employees, despite its staff working fewer hours, according to employee pay data from the city controls office. The, po- the police department has attributed the reduced hour work, work worked to a staff shortage. The Daily Wire reported, according to Supervisor Matt Dorsey, a former police communications staffer, the police department's full-duty police officers have been reduced by 335 from 2017. The city had 15, 1,537 officers as of January. A police staffing analysis estimated the city needed more than 2,100. That means they're down by 6 Hundred officers they need. 600 officers are down by. Following the death of George Floyd three years ago, San Francisco embarked on the then popular defund the police movement. So, what does this tell us? Defunding the police is a bad idea. Because who are you going to call? You're going to call a community organizer? You're going to call a therapist whenever things got a hand? It doesn't work. It does not work. Now, again from the Daily Wire... Catholic Vote quotes, in July 2020, Mayor Landon Breed announced that $120 million would be cut from the police and sheriff's department. Quote, reforming our criminal justice system must go hand in hand with police policy changes and budget investments to make our city more equitable. End quote. She said, she goes on and says, by redirecting funding from law enforcement agencies back into the African-American community, we are putting our words into action, and we are doing it by listening to a community that for too long has been unheard and un- un- under- underserved. A subsequent soaring in property crime rate forced Breed to reverse course, and the police budget was actually increased. Again, all these people do these virtual signaling, write out all these things, but in the real world, all these ideas does not work. Does not work. All these ideas are just jokes. These ideas are just ways to symbol, to show a forth your virtue. Say, hey, look, over here, I care about the issues you care about. I'm posting the black square. I'm putting the Ukraine flag in my bio. I'm putting the rainbow, I'm putting my pronouns in my bio. Nobody actually believes any of these things. They're all just, they're all just virtue signaling. They don't actually believe any of it. Because as soon as it comes to reality, they all give up. Because none of these ideas work in the real world. It's all fake. Now, lastly, the last thing I want to talk about here is, again, John Fetterman. We talked about this a couple of days ago about the dress code in the Senate, and the House, rather, that they're going to get rid of it because John Fetterman doesn't want to wear a suit. And I was giving a talk at St. John Vianney, the St. Anne's Society, to the moms there. And one of the things I was talking about was clothing. I was talking about the importance of clothing. And Senator John Fetterman put a tweet out saying that he was going to shut down the, that if the House stops and said, if those, he basically gives an insult there, and the House stop trying to shut our government down and fully support Ukraine, then I will save democracy by wearing a suit on the Senate floor next week. And he put out a number of things making fun of people about suits. He made fun of people in clothes, and he shows up in shorts and a hoodie, all these different things. And columnist Tim Murtaugh said, no one has ever been this proud of being a slob since a Muppet lived in a trash can. And it reminded me of the talk I was giving yesterday, where professor I was reading a quote from Professor Plenio Correa de Oliveira, who said that a vulgar man is he who sees a man wearing a suit and tie and thinks, I hate this man. He would like the man to have an open collar without a tie. If the properly dressed man takes off his tie, the vulgar man is not satisfied. Then he loathingly says, why doesn't he take off his jacket? If the vulgar man sees someone without a jacket, he says with abhorrence, why doesn't he wear his shirt outside his pants instead of keeping it tucked in? If he sees a man with his shirt tucked out, he says, why doesn't he wear blue jeans? He says, I am not describing here a person who is envious of the better dressed man because the latter has more than he does. Rather, the critical one is a person whose very constitution makes him feel co-natural with vulgar things. The more vulgar a thing is, the more pleased he is. And the more elevated a thing is, the more uncomfortable he feels around it because he identifies himself 
with vulgarity. This is exactly what John Fetterman is. John Fetterman is a vulgar man. And we do not desire to be vulgar men. Instead, let's be men of the sublime, men of God. And the dress maketh the man. So let's dress with dignity, recognizing that we are always in the sight of our king and queen in heaven. We'll be right back with Alan Smith with Bishop Sheen today. Our family had been going through crisis. Little by little, we just found ourselves drifting completely away. I was afraid to go back. I mean, I cried the first time I received the sacraments again. Cried because I was back and because I had allowed God to become a part of me again. It's united our family. There's peace in our home that we didn't have before. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for any reason, visit catholicscomehome.org today. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Minute. Have you ever heard someone say, all religions believe basically the same thing. They only differ in their external forms, in the way they express it. G.K. Chesterton says the truth is precisely the other way around. The religions of the world do not differ greatly in rites and forms. They do differ greatly in what they teach. In most every religion, people pray, they sing, they read sacred texts, they honor their traditions, they have special feasts, they light candles and so on. But they don't teach the same things. They don't believe the same things. There's only one religion that believes that Christ is the Son of God, that he suffered and died for our sins and that he rose from the dead. Only one religion believes in one holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Want more than a minute? Chesterton.org. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We're currently cruising at 39,000 feet. We'll turn that seatbelt sign off for you and let you move about the cabin. Looks like we're about two hours and ten minutes from landing. Plenty of time for you to pray for religious vocations. Wouldn't it be great if everyone prayed daily for vocations to the religious life? Why not start today? A friendly suggestion from Guadalupe Radio Network. We are a young and diverse generation, helping those in need and promoting human rights. We care for the environment. We embrace authentic witnesses and dream of a better world. Our passion comes from God, who loves us even when we fall and cheers on our victories. If you sometimes wonder, is there something more? Then come and see at CatholicsComeHome.com. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. It's so good to be on today. Praise be to God. It's so good to be here. Despite the fact that the world is crazy, it's always good to be here. A little breath of sanity in the world, right? So, praise be to God. And my little breath of sanity is every Thursday at 7 o'clock Central Time. Our good friend, Alan Smith with Bishop Sheen today, hops on with us and shares us some inspiring words and some good fruits of meditation. Good morning to you, Mr. Alan Smith. Good morning, Adrian. Uh, welcome back. I always say welcome back. You know, I, you went away for a little while, and you're back, but I'm getting used to you being back. And, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, we always worry when you start to travel, is he going to leave again? You're getting so famous. You always think, oh, he's going to be speaking here and speaking there. But uh, it's good that you're staying close to home. It's well, always good. Speaking of, uh, of traveling around and doing giving speeches, you're actually just getting back from your parish missions. Uh, tell me about how that all went. Well, it was uh, a resounding success. Whenever you uh, come into a parish and you present, uh, again, what I call... Um, you know, the good stuff, um, you know, meditations on the holy face of Jesus, uh, meditations on the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, you know, you can't lose. Um, I add in meditations from St. Therese, the Little Flower, and of course, uh, the Venerable Fulton J. Sheen. So uh, we keep them busy. We keep them uh, wanting more. And uh, so I'm a blessed man. 
and uh, I get invited to bring my uh, show on the road. And I, I call it a show in the sense that you have to bring a lot of gear. People who see uh, the setup of the parish mission, see the beautiful banners of the Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen and St. Therese of the Child Jesus and the full Holy Face. I bring with me the relics of the Holy Face. I'm blessed in that I have a few relics and I set them up um, on a beautiful um, display where people can come and kneel before the relic and venerate the relic and pray. Um, again, we do that. And of course, I bring with me, you know, 30 uh, different Sheen titles, the books he wrote, and of course, Holy Face prayer cards and chaplets. Uh, I even bring some of my hoodies from my business. Uh, people know me as the gas man. Uh, pray, trust, don't worry is my my motto that I wear on my shirt clothing. So uh, again, I bring everything. Uh, it takes a lot of work to set up, but uh, well worth it. And uh, again, it's a little village uh, in Ontario, uh, but yet uh, they came uh, in great numbers. So uh, we need missions. People are hungry for missions. They they really want to hear presentations, the you know the wisdom of Archbishop Sheen, the the beauty of the Holy Face. So uh, it was a great <laughs> it was a great day, and I look forward to doing it again. So uh, uh, I try to do one a month and uh, happy balance, but uh, still. Uh, again, I'll share with you uh, shortly some of the insights um, that I shared with people about devotion to the Holy Face. Yeah, that praise be to God. Uh, but before we do that, uh, my favorite thing about giving talks is interacting with the people afterwards. Uh, what was kind of the the because uh, you kind of you kind of learn a lot about what the average person is thinking and feeling whenever you go there. Uh, what did you kind of see there? Well, I just. You know, it's funny, I go back to basics, and yet people they always say, oh, you are so right. Like, I talk about where's the crucifix in your life. Do you have a crucifix, um, you know, on your nightstand, on your desk? Um, you know, are they in your home? Are they on, is, is, is there a crucifix in every room? And uh, where are your holy pictures? Uh, you know, me being a plumber, I get into people's houses and I see that many in many houses, the holy pictures have been taken down because uh, we're worried what the neighbors will think. Um, so it's that gentle reminder. Uh, but the one comment that I think really um, got people was I talked about uh, curiosity, and it can be uh, a detrimental thing. Uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary uh, shares with us, there's a beauty in not knowing. Uh, there's something about this holy innocence that we need to uh, strive for. And yet, uh, many of people came up to me and says, when you talked about uh, curiosity, I, I thought, I'm guilty of that. I got to know everything. I got to be up on the gossip. I got to, oh, find out about this, find out about that. Um, this call to the simple life of not knowing is a good thing. It's a good thing. So that was some of the feedback I got. And um, again, everybody just wants more sheen. So they're always asking about the next book and the next release. But um Again, I've always got something for them for next year. And this is the second time I visited this parish. I gave a mission uh, a year earlier. And uh, so they had me back a second time. And they'll probably have me back a third time. So there's always new material to present. Alan, it's uh, it's pretty funny. The There is um, one of our friends commented, uh, this isn't fair. My heart rate has uh, significantly calmed down since Alan started speaking. And your your lovely wife also said uh, that her heart rate has greatly improved since marrying Ellen. Uh, praise be to God. I think that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. And we start off with all these bad news and heart rate's getting up. And then Alan comes in. And you're like, oh, okay. The world's not, uh, this world's not that bad. It's, not, it's okay. Uh, Alan, tell me about the holy face. Well, it, it is a devotion for our time. Um, you know, I think people... Uh, when COVID happened and we were in isolation, uh, some people call it lock lockdown. <laughs> uh, you can call it whatever you want, but uh, it was an opportunity to work on your uh, personal prayer. Uh, you know, what devotions were near and dear to your heart. And uh, this idea of showing uh, the face of Christ um, was really came out during COVID. Um, this devotion to the Holy Face just started to take on a great appeal because while we were masking our face, covering our face, the Lord was, um, again, giving the 
uh, I want to say the opposite presentation of showing his face. And uh, so again, it came at an appropriate time uh, in history uh, during COVID, uh, this resurgence of this beautiful devotion, which is an old devotion, uh, a devotion that was practiced by the saints, St. Augustine, St. Therese of Lisieux, uh, St. Gertrude, St. Mechthilde, um, again, many popes. It's, it's an, a devotion that goes back to, of course, the veil of Veronica being given uh, to um, be housed in the Vatican. And of course, it's venerated many times a year. So uh, it's a beautiful old devotion that is a devotion needed for today. Uh, because really, the devotion to the Holy Face is to help make reparation for the sins against the first three commandments. And uh, we need to make reparation. And this, this is the thing, God's holy name, the holy days of obligation, uh, the blasphemies that are uttered today, uh, we need to counteract that. And uh, we're in a spiritual war. So again, this devotion makes sense. And I think everybody's nodding their head as I speak about how uh, when you open your Bible, uh, I believe the word face is mentioned 840 times. And the word countenance is mentioned 101 times. So there's over 900 scripture passages that talk about the face of God. So uh, there's something there. The saints, the Bible, uh, again, it is a devotion for our times. Why do you think that um, people who, because I know so many Catholics, I mean, Every, I don't think there's a single Catholic who doesn't know someone who has a huge devotion to St. Therese of Lisieux, yet St. Therese of Lisieux is known as a little flower. They, someone might know her as St. Therese of Lisieux of the child Jesus, but almost nobody, even in the pictures of her, they usually crop it it's in such a way that they don't see the image of the holy face and they don't recognize her as St. Therese of Lisieux of the child Jesus in the holy face. And why do you think that is? Um, hard to say, because I think sometimes we want to create the saints for our own lives. Um, you know, the cuteness of the child Jesus, the cuteness of St. Therese, the little flower. But when you, you embrace the holy face, now you talk about the passion, his suffering. Uh, again, we want to paint our own pictures. And maybe that's why. But St. Therese uh, was very adamant that when she took her profession and wanted, to, of course, to incorporate her religious name, she went and said, you know, no, no, I want to be St. Therese of the Child Jesus and of the Holy Face. Um, her father had enrolled her in the Arch Confraternity of the Holy Face. And so uh, even as a child, she started to meditate and pray with the image of the Holy Face. And of course, she loved the writings of Marie de Saint-Pierre, a Carmelite from Tours, who uh, the devotion of the Holy Face was revealed to her. And St. Therese actually had a locket of her hair that she kept with her. And so uh, she took this zeal that Marie de Saint-Pierre had uh, before her and uh, followed through with it in her religious life. And so uh, she loved the Holy Face uh, you know, when you look at her writings. But again, I think it goes back to we want to paint our own picture of what the what we think the saint should be. Now, I think especially, I mean, oof, I don't even, we, I definitely will be talking about this um, either tomorrow or next week. There was in Louisiana this horrific, horrific image of this statue of Satan um, with uh, with our Lord's head uh, in his hands, and it was just absolutely blasphemous and horrible. And my immediate thought is, what greater devotion is necessary today than the holy face devotion? Especially when we see things like that, our Lord's face was so wounded by the Romans, by the Jews, and now that we wound them over and over again, we don't stop. We don't stop. So tell me about this in, in regards to acts of reparation and acts of, of love and comfort to our Lord. Well, I think it was one of the great saints, and I, I don't know who it was, said that, you know, we crucified our Lord on Friday, but we as Christians crucify him again on Sunday. Um, again, by not going to Holy Mass, 
by making Sunday just another work day. Um, it, it's so sad. And yet, you know, we're called to action. We're called to be, um, again, more attentive, uh, more disciplined in making it to Mass, especially those holy days of obligation. Uh, we forget those. Um, are we making reparation when we're out on the streets? Like, um, how many times we hear blasphemy? I hear the Lord's name taken in vain uh, 20 times a day, I think, maybe even more. But I have an opportunity every day to make reparation by uttering a praise. Um, we say the words in Latin, sit nomen domini benedictum. You know, may the Lord, may the name of the Lord be praised. Um, Vado retro santana, get behind me, Satan. Um, again, every time we hear a blasphemy, we should be uttering uh, a praise to God uh, to counteract that. And I think this is, uh, we forget that we're soldiers for Christ. Uh, we were all confirmed. I like to say we're all confirmed, but many of us were confirmed and we became soldiers for Christ. And so uh, these acts of reparation are so important um, because we have to realize to say God made a day holy. Uh, he made his name holy. Um, and we need to reverence the holy name of Jesus. Um, again, the work is just begun, it seems, because the blasphemies are increasing. But Our Lady has called us to make reparation and her many apparitions all over the world. Uh, it's a constant message uh, from heaven to make reparation, so we have to do our part. Amen, amen. I was thinking what you were saying, that of St. Louis the Ninth, whenever he was uh, trying to punish blasphemy in his, in his country and people started attacking him for it, he said afterwards, referring to this manner, he said, Would to God that my tongue should be pierced with a hot iron, if only by suffering this I might be able to root out of my kingdom every word of blasphemy or dishonor against God's most holy name. And when someone praised him for his zeal, he answered, I prefer to hear the maledictions that are poured forth against me when I cause to be executed the law I have passed than to hear the words of praise you have lavishing upon me. I think that's a beautiful thing, something that we should all keep in mind. Uh, but check out Bishop Sheen today. God bless you, Alan. God bless you. God love you. And everyone get a picture of the holy face in your house and uh, start to look upon the Lord and pray that prayer. Lord, show us thy face and we shall be saved. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Alan. We'll see you in the after show. And that's going to do it. BishopSheenToday.com. Bishop Sheen Today. Look it up. We're going to go into our fear and trembling game show. You could call in that number 877-757-9424. 877 877- Seven five seven nine four two four. That's the number to call to be part of the game show. We could be giving you a prize. Okay, that number eight seven 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 five seven nine four two four. Make sure you call in that one last time. Eight seven 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 five seven nine four two four. We'll be right back. Are you feeling lost in a sea of overwhelm? Hi, this is Coach Felicity with Stand Tall Today Coaching Minute. Many people find themselves challenged with overwhelm. Too many things to take care of, too many people to please, too much work to do. And in spite of their best efforts, they continue to fall behind with this overwhelm coming in like a flood. But that's not the abundant life that Jesus wants you to live. That's why Stand Tall Today has experienced professional coaches that will assist you in dialing down that overwhelm. They'll help you get a grasp on where you are and create a plan that enables you to take bite-sized steps of action so you can live an abundant life. Why not take your first step right now? Go to StandTallToday.com and find a coach that is just right for you. Because life is simply too short to stay lost in a sea of overwhelm. This is Coach Felicity with your Stand Tall Today Coaching Minute. Over the years, people were treated as less than human because they were a different race, a different faith, or vulnerable. But over time, we must learn that we are all God's children, created in His image, that all human creation has an inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, a right to love and be loved. So let's cherish the sanctity of life because we know how it feels when others treat us as less than human. Welcome to another round of fear and trembling. (laughs) The Catholic trivia game show that helps you work out your salvation 
by the seat of your pants. It's a 50-50 chance and prizes are involved. Avoid the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Call now to take your shot. 877-757-9424. 877-757-9424. That's the number to call to be part of our game show, Fear and Trembling, where we give out prizes and you could win. It's really simple. All I got to do is pick up your phone and dial that number, 877-757-9424, 877-757-9424. And if you've called in in the past, and it's been a little while, if it's been a few weeks, then make sure to call back in. We'd love to have you as a return guest on our show, that number, 877-757-9424. And if you've never called in before, or perhaps if you've never, you are new to the Catholic Drive Time Show as a whole, a call in 877-757-9424. I'm thinking specifically of Amarillo. I mean, it's the morning Amarillo, uh, so it's time to call in 877-757-9424. We'd love to hear from you. Now, you may be asking, what exactly are you asking me to call in for? What is going on? It's really simple. We're Here I have in front of me three Catholic trivia questions. And the trick is I'm not going to ask you the questions. Instead, I'm going to ask Rudy the questions. Rudy's going to give me an answer. It's your job to tell me whether or not Rudy is right or whether or not he is wrong, which means even if you just guess, if there's a 50-50 chance of you getting the answer correct. And every right answer goes into the coffee cup of divine providence to win this week's prize. Rudy. What could they win? Thanks be to God. Our sponsor this week is Conversion Starters, and you're going to be able to win a prize pack from Conversion Starters. You might be wondering, what exactly is a conversion starter? Well, you can kind of take a little guess from the name. It's a conversation starter, but it's for conversions. Now, Conversion Starters makes evangelization easy and painless for everyone. Conversion Starters t-shirts, hoodies, and mugs, they catch people's eye, their attention. They pique their curiosity by featuring common questions about Catholicism along with a very convenient website where they can go and read a brief and easy-to-understand answer to those questions. So you can be a billboard for Christ. Visit conversionstarters.com, because Conversion Starters is evangelization for introverts. There you go. There you go. Uh, So praise be to God. Uh, You could be winning that prize from Conversion Starters. All you got to do is dial that number. I'll give it to you again, 877-757-9424. And I have good news for you because I'm checking out right now, and I'm seeing that right now the next person to call in will have the opportunity to be our winner this week. That number, 877-757-9424. That is the number, and you could be the winner. It's very simple. It's very easy. And it's a lot of fun. That number, 877-757-9424. So call in, and we'd love to chat with you, wherever you're calling in from. Now, if we don't get a caller, though, then we will play the game nonetheless. And we'll discuss the answers. And we will just put in the the, the, the answers. The uh, I will choose someone to uh, just get those little tickets. And I'm thinking... I'll probably give it to somebody in our in our CDT insiders chat. Ooh. That's probably, probably what I'll do. I think that's that'll be the play. Insiders uh, chat? Insiders How do you join chat. the insiders chat, Amy? Oh, well, it's really simple, actually. All you have to do is go to grnonline.com mm-hmm. forward slash CDT. And when you do so, you actually will have an opportunity to uh, be on our email list. And we send you an email every single Friday around noon and linked there is actually a link to join our Telegram chat. And in our Telegram chat, we interact with the CDT crew all day long uh, during the weekends. Sometimes we even hop on video chats and things like that, uh, make special, unique content that's exclusive to our CDT listeners uh, that are on our Telegram chat. But what if you don't have thumbs and you can't type in CDT, you know, grnonline.com forward slash CDT? If you don't have thumbs, I don't, do you need thumbs to be able to type? Well, I guess if you're typing your on your keyboard. Yeah. Well, I guess that's the answer. You got to go on your keyboard. Oh, oh, I was thinking. <laughs> oh, you're talking about your phone. I was thinking the uh, of a, a key. A, yeah, yeah. I was thinking a physical keyboard. But no, you're right. I guess yeah. If you using your phone, that would make things difficult. I don't know what you would do. <laughs> I guess you, there's some kind of accessibility uh, option, I suppose. Right. 
Uh, voice to text. So. Voice to text, I guess. Use your index fingers. Oh, use your index finger. Yeah, just lay it flat and <laughs> type on that way. All right. Uh, joining us right now is Tony. Good morning to you, Tony. Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. Praise be to God. Is this our friends, uh, Kim and Tony? That's right. Praise be to God. Good morning. I haven't heard from y'all in a little while. It's good to hear his voice. You too. You too. And my dad just got a new car, um, if he didn't hear. Well, praise be to God. That is awesome. Uh, I also got a new car and a great, m- massive uh, car bill that goes with it. We love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kim and Tony, y'all are veterans on the show. Y'all know how the game is played. Um, and I've got to tell y'all, I think that these questions will be super easy for y'all. I think y'all are going to ace these questions. They're not the easiest questions, but I think you're going to do great. Are you ready to play? Yep, yep I'll nail it. All right. I know he. W- I know you will. Uh, question number one for you, Rudy. Okay. From which group of citizens are the Swiss guards recruited from? Mm, yes, they're actually French. I was thinking they that. are French, French Catholics, mm-hmm. and they recruit them specifically from a border town near Switzerland. So really? not actually, not actually Switzerland, wow. but France. Okay, and I guess maybe they. Uh, train them in Switzerland? That's why they call them the Swiss Guard? Or what's up with that? Um, no, they just like the cheese. Oh. <laughs> it has nothing to do with it. Well, that's understandable. Yeah, they like I, the, I the cheese, that. Swiss cheese. Okay, well, there you go, folks. All right, Kim and Tony, 15 seconds on the clock. The question on the board is, from which group of citizens are the Swiss Guards recruited from? Rudy says it's actually France, but... It's specifically a region of France that borders Switzerland, and those are where they get the recruitments from. Uh, What say you, Tony, and Kim? (laughs) Oh, well, let's see. Uh, Let's check out. Survey says... That is correct! That is correct. Uh, No, actually, it is actually Switzerland. It is, yeah. I mean, pretty pretty self-explanatory, I would say. I, I would argue. All right, you guys are doing great so far. That is a 100% success rate so far. I'm, I'm seeing a, a uh, opportunity for three out of three is my guess. Are you ready for question number two? Yes. All right, let's look at it. Question number two for you, Rudy. At what age is a cardinal no longer able to participate in the election of a pope? That's a trick question, Adrian, mm, because like it? the United States, okay, there is no term limit. There's for, no term yeah, limit. Yeah, there's no term limit for the cardinals, so they can vote all the way up till they die. Wow. Wow. That is, a, that is pretty old. That is pretty old. All right. Uh, 15 seconds on the clock, Kim and Tony. The question on the board is, at what age is a cardinal unable to participate in the election of a new pope Rudy says, that's a trick question. They're always able to vote for the new pope. It's no term limits. Uh, What say you, Kim and Tony? He got it right. He got it right. Are you sure? Yep. All right. Let's see. A survey says. Wait, no, no, no. (laughs) No, the, uh, the correct answer is actually 80. It's 80 years old. Yeah, when you when you turn 80, you are no longer allowed to vote. Uh, that was actually changed by Pope Paul the Sixth. He made it to the, the cardinal electors had to be under the age of 80, and the it was uh, changed a few times in terms of how many electors there could be and all these different things have all changed over time. It used to be the case that basically if you were a cardinal, you were a cardinal to the day you died. Uh, but now they kind of retire the cardinals and. Um, they can make exceptions, but generally speaking, it's it's 80. It's 80. So don't worry, Kim and Tony. It's uh, not a big deal. I'm sure you're going to get this last question right. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's do it. Uh, Rudy, for you, what is the third highest choir of angels? The third highest. The That's third gonna highest. That's going to be uh, powers. The powers. The powers. I, I can feel it. I can feel the power. Can you feel it? I can feel it. I'm the feeling power. it now. Especially when you say it like that. You get the a, power. You get a drop an octave. The power. The power. I say it like that. Otherwise, it's just kind of weird, right? All right. 
Kim and Tony, 15 seconds on the clock. The question on the board is, which is the third highest Choir of Angels? So starting from the top and going down, the third highest Choir of Angels. Rudy says, it's the powers. What say you, Kim and Tony? Oh, gosh. Um, that's a trick question. Um, I think I'm going to go for he will be right. Are you sure about that? No, wrong. <laughs> All right, let's see. Survey says... <clears throat> that was a long drum roll. That is correct. Way to go, Kim and Tony. See, it was impossible to trick you. You just knew that one. That was easy peasy, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the third highest is actually the Thrones. The thrones are the third highest. It is uh, the seraphim, the cherubim, then the thrones. And let's see if I can remember the other ones. It's dominions, principalities, powers, archangels, and then guardian angels. I think that's right. I think I nailed that. I'm pretty sure. I think I missed one. Uh, if I missed one, I'm going to get a bunch of people like yelling at me later. They're like, you missed one of them, and I, I probably didn't miss one of them. But I think that's it. I think that's the number. I should have looked it up. Uh, but very good, Kim and Tony. God bless you. You rocked it. Praise be to God. Uh, you're in two for three. How do you feel? Great. Great. We're actually going to be in Houston tomorrow for a wedding. Hey, praise be to God. Uh, what parish are you going to be at? Oh, my goodness. I'm not sure. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> well, if y'all like to swing by the studio, let us know. You yeah, can find my free. email at grnonline.com forward slash CDT. If you are in in time, we'd be, I'd love to say hi. Uh, but God bless you. God love you. Stay on hold. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And we are going to go to our after show. So if you can join us in the after show, we'd love to have you. Hop on YouTube, Facebook, and we'd love to chat with you directly. So hop on there. And it'll be a great time. Uh, but if not, we'll see you back tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern, across the Guadalupe Radio Network and Catholic Spirit Radio. God bless you. God love you. And we'll see you very soon. And remember, Christ is risen. Truly, he is risen. Alleluia. Alleluia. Remember, I pray that God bless you and Mary Immaculate keep you under her mantle. God love you. And we'll see you in just a moment. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you. And welcome back to the after show. So good to be on with you today. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Let's see. Did anybody correct me? Did I get any of the, did I get the angels correct? Let's see. Uh, Paisley said, I think it's a throne. She got it. She got it. Uh, let's see. The cherubim, seraphim, thrones. Uh, I think, uh, let's see. White Wolf, I think you got him wrong. Cherubim, seraphim, principalities, powers, dominions, virtues. Isn't dominions? Isn't, um, no, yeah, this is, I think yours are wrong, White Wolf. I think you have the order wrong. Let's see. I'm going to look it up. Hold on. Hold on. We're going to look this up. We're going to find out what the correct ordering of the angels are. Hierarchy of angels. Let's see. The angelic hierarchy. Let's see. You have the seraphim, the cherubim, the thrones. So those are the first three. Then the second three are the dominions, the virtues, and the powers. The power. Oh, that's what I forgot. The virtues. I forgot the virtues. So dominions, virtues, the powers, then the principalities, archangels, and angels. So it's in that order. That's the order. That's according to St. Thomas Aquinas. So there you go. Let's see. Virtue. Yeah, Dave Palmer just texted me. He said virtues. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I figured it out. I didn't figure it out, actually. I looked it up. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Uh, there you go. That's so funny. That's so funny. <laughs> Whoops. My Brooke, bad. Brooke says, I still don't see Blight Wolf's comments. Ha <laughs> ha. Blight Wolf. 
That's uh, funny. Sometimes. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, let's see. Sonia said, a good afternoon show topic would be a choir of angels. I mean, angel choirs. No, that's a great idea. Adrian, uh, Adrian comp- complimented me the other day. He said, I had the voice of an angel, and I said, before or after the fall. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Let's see. The um, No, that's a good idea. Maybe we should do a show on angels. I haven't done it. We haven't done a show on angels in a long time. And I got the perfect guest. Do you? Yeah. Who? Debbie Giorgiani oh, and Adam uh, Bly. Hello. No. <laughs> Obviously. Oh yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> Obby. No, let's like let's get it. Let's, let's get not it. get yeah, that. Let's, let's get, <laughs> no, let's get the obvious one. Yeah, you tune in on Saturdays if you want to hear from them. Oh, um, we should get Father Martin's. You know, I saw Father Martin on um Yesterday? On Saturday. No way. Yeah, uh, Sunday. No, uh, wanna, yeah, yeah. On Sunday. I want to meet him in person. So so Sunday. After we did the flotilla. Wait, you saw him uh, in Milwaukee? In Milwaukee? Yeah. No way. Yeah, yeah. So that is at, sick. After the flotilla, we all went back to the seat and um, we got we ate dinner and then we there was a um, a reliquary, a relic of St. Jude's of uh, mm. his um what is that here, his forearm? What is that bone called? Uh funny uh, bone? No, it's it's the whole it's like the whole forearm. Um, there's a name for that bone. I forget. Someone, someone, let me know in the chat what that bone is called. Um, Fibia? No, that's in the no, leg. That's, yeah, I don't Tibia? Know. I don't know. But they had um, the forearm. It's a relic there, and so we all drove out to go give uh, in Thanksgiving for the event, and to ask uh, St. Jude's intercession for impossible causes. The humerus. Um, it's the fibula. Fibula? Yeah. Prepper Dream Crusher says the fibula. Um, but the, um, it was, uh, and so we were there and all of a sudden, who do I see walk up to, uh, to take, uh, to start putting things away? The relic man himself. The relic man himself, Father Mar- uh, Carlos Martin. And I was like, oh, well, that's kind of funny. I was going to go say hi, but he was pretty busy. He was like running and packaging things up, trying to get out of there. We were, we showed up at like nine 30 and they closed at 10. So oh, man. man, they were closing down the reliquary stuff. They'd been there the whole day. So Alberto like, says the tib and fib. Oh, well, there you go. Tib and fib, baby. The tibula and the fibula. Let's see. I don't know. I feel like this chair is sinking as the day goes on. As the show is going on. You just need to go on a uh, diet. Diet. Yeah, I think that's what it is. <laughs> I think that's probably true. Let's see. Which is why today is the last day before your diet. We're going to get cheese curds. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Dude, I love cheese curds. <laughs> Cheese curds are so good. Yeah, let's go to let's go to Culper's after this. <laughs> it was funny. Oh, so on on Sunday, um, no, on Monday, on Monday when I was doing the show remotely, uh, when I went to go get breakfast with the TFP afterwards, we uh, was there one over there? No, well, we we did get cheese curds while I was in Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. okay. But um, he goes, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Evan and Mr. Rex were like, uh, Mr. Adrian, we uh, I got to confess, um. Uh, we were uh, tuning in to, to your show, uh, dear, listening to you upstairs. Uh, we were watching you, and we were laughing at, uh, at the after show. Because you know, y'all, 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 y'all kept on talking about food. <laughs> 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 and I was like, yeah, it is kind of funny. We always end up devolving into talking about food for some reason. I think it's because it's morning. It's and I'm I'm hungry. hungry. Yeah, like <laughs> it's, it's, it gets that time of day. You got to understand, at this point, this is lunchtime for us. Yeah. Like, we've been up long enough that this is actually our lunchtime. Yeah. So we're starving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. Let's see. Let's see. And White will say, I thought you were talking about Father Martin Navarro. No, I haven't seen Father Martin Navarro in a while, actually. I need to go visit him. Um, we'll see. Maybe I'll visit him so sometime soon. I don't know. Let's see. Oh, do, 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 do. There's a lot of uh, comments here. Oh, I want to go back to one of the comments that White Wolf made earlier. I thought it was interesting. We could talk about that for a second. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. The, uh, that was way back. I didn't realize how far back that was. Uh, oh, well, I can't find it. Sorry. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't find it, but it's too far back. I don't wanna, I don't want to keep digging. Let's see. The fibula is the legs, says Paisley. I broke both the tib and the fib, so I know. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, yikes. 
Uh, let's see. Wario said I flunked anatomy, so I would know a leg bone from a backbone. Uh, there you go. How many bones are in the body? 251? 251. Uh, Alan Smith is joining us again. Good morning, Alan. Hey, good morning. It's great to be here. I'm just working on the website. Uh, thanks. Uh, you know, it's funny, um, you know, with Bishop Sheen, um, there's always new books being re-released -re and uh, try to keep up on that. Uh, I've been working on large print editions. Um, the eyes are getting older and uh, <laughs> more and more people are saying, could you make books in a large print edition? And I'm starting to do that, um, taking some of the titles that I publish um, and make them into large print editions with 16 point fonts. Um, and, and yeah, it's amazing. I did Calvary in the Mass, large print edition. You can find that at Bishop Sheen Today Publishing. Uh, go to Amazon, do Calvary in the Mass, large print edition, and you'll find my version. And um, I tell you, it, it was a hit. We, we did a, you know, when you do a test run or a test market, or whatever, everybody loves large print edition. Mm. Um, yeah, so uh, working on that. So I uh, got to put a link, and you know, with, with technology, it's always this this hyperlink takes you to there, takes you to here, and so it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. I, I don't know how people can keep up with the technology. Uh, it really is something. I I like the back to book basics. Just go in the bookstore and say, I want that one, want that one. But now when you shop online. And you Google something, there's just too many choices. So, anyway, so it's we're funny. Away there, but I was talking yeah. to, yeah. I went to go get lunch with um, my old professor, Dr. Rebard, yesterday, and uh, we were chatting, and he was telling me that um, he's reading this. These, uh, he's right now, he's on a on a kick on technology, where he's reading all these uh, books on technology and its effects, and he's like, yeah, it seems to me that the net negative of technology does not come anywhere close to the positives of technology and that uh, obviously like there if we're going to have technology it's good that there's good things there but it would just be better if we just could, if all the technology was just gone it was just excised from our lives and uh, the the great advice of john senior who said um to go out and smash your television set uh, could be modified to basically just smash all of your technology that you have um and john senior was kind of a luddite he was uh, very much anti-technology, and all the fears of technology turned out to be pretty accurate. It turned out to be pretty true. So, you know, it's always Just like Uncle Ted. Uncle Ted? Yeah. What do you mean? Uh, no, wait. No, I'm not talking about Uncle Ted. I'm talking about somebody else. I'm talking about... Who's the Unabomber? Ted Kaczynski. Ted Kaczynski. Ted Kaczynski. Uh, Ted Kaczynski. He was right about technology. Uh, okay. Well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess, I guess, I don't know anything. Maybe about his technology. approach was wrong. Like, you know, some Bombing people, places. some people in the chat, their approach is is wrong most of the time. Yeah. But uh, their their heart is in it. I would say. <laughs> yeah, Alan, what do you think about technology? Love hate relationship. Love hate relationship. Yeah. I like the I like the old um, the old way of just uh, give me a call, not this texting, not this thing like call me let's talk you know and uh, there's something with that but um it is a love-hate relationship but um i don't know when they turn the power off none of the technology is going to work so um <laughs> we got to go back to old school way of just going knocking on the neighbor's door and saying can i borrow a, a few eggs and a cu cup of milk and uh I always say a liter of milk, you know, because we're in Canada, right? <laughs> have to throw that in. <laughs> Although I am going to the United States today. I'm going to do some cross-border shopping. Um, of course, I live in Canada, but many of my books, it's cheaper for me to ship my books to oh. my U.S. postal address. Yeah. And so I cross over the border, uh, do a little shopping, and um, come back home to Mama. Get and, some good uh, food. When the, yeah, good food. I don't know, like I... You have so many good sporting goods stores like Kabbalah's <laughs> and Dick's um, Sporting Goods and all these stuff. Like, I mean, basically, it takes me five minutes to get my books, but then I get lost. <laughs> um, you know, and you know, the gas is cheaper. Like, your gas is cheaper really? in America. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to believe. Extra... Ron DeSantis put out a policy thing over the weekend or over a couple of days ago saying that he will be able to get gas prices to the national average of $2. And I was like, dude, 
if you're telling me the truth, you just won my vote. Is that before <laughs> or after the taxes that are imposed on the gas? Because, you know, it's like a state, there's a state tax and then there's a federal tax. And by the time you fact, yeah, you didn't know that? There's a state tax on gas? Yeah. So if you look at the, at the, uh, at the pump, it actually has a, a sticker from, you know, the Weights and Measures office. And it says this much is taken out. It's automatically taken out and included Bruh. in the price. So by the time, oh, okay. so by the time you're paying, you're you're paying almost a dollar for those taxes, on, and then you know that's factored into the price. So if there wasn't that right now, which some states took it off when there was like you know this like gas scare thing going on, uh, I think you're you're going to be paying like I don't know two dollars, two dollars no and fifty cents. Yeah, dude. That's ridiculous. That makes me Isn't mad. Isn't that crazy? That makes me mad. But, Alan, I you totally do. understand yeah. because, uh, you know, we, we've we uh, had to ship things to Canada before, and it's so expensive. If you buy anything from Canada, like on eBay, it's like $30 to ship it to the United States. That's crazy. Yeah. There was supposed to be the North American Free Trade Agreement, <laughs> something like that. And, mm-hmm. and maybe, the, again, it's there's certain things that are – uh, more accessible, but still shipping and handling. <laughs> That's always what it is, you know. The shipping cost is ten dollars, but oh, because we touched it, it's another thirty. So, mm. um, yeah, it's 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 crazy, man. But I mean, don't don't. I thought that you cross the border into Mexico for, you know, cheaper goods. I don't know if there's a lot of cross border shopping between Texas and Mexico or. There's just too much traffic with all the people crossing the border on foot. I, I don't know. Or is it dangerous? Uh, yeah, there's too much traffic you know, coming back in. <laughs> yeah, coming back in, right? So um, um, I might go to Mexico and get a root canal because my tooth yeah. feels really bad. I think Adrian, wow. g- I don't know. Gave you a root canal? He gave me like a, <laughs> gave you a, gave me enough stress to have, need a root canal. Right. Right. Yeah, but I, I must say, the ascot looks really good on you. Hey, um, thank you, Alan. Like, thank you for I mean, noticing. I'm, I'm a fashionista in that, you know, during college, I sold suits. So, no way. Um, I didn't know yeah. that. That's cool. Yeah, no, yeah. That's pretty No, nice. I was in the fashion industry in college to help. So was Rudy. You know, yeah. Yeah. But no, Kindred so spirits. all these, these, like, you know, nice shoes, brogues, different things, the ascot, the puffs, all that. I mean, it's uh, it's something, and I think, you know, with uh, Bishop Sheen, he always dressed impeccably. He was, uh, you know, he always shined his shoes. He always says, I'm a, an ambassador for Christ, so look the part, uh, dress well. And so, Rudy, uh, full credit to you today for the ascot. You <laughs> you wore the you wore the ascot. It didn't wear you. So there you go. <laughs> there you um, go. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and Adrian, where's your miraculous medal? Like, what's going on? <laughs> you know, yeah. And you know, like, it's it's hard to wear the scapular and the ascot. So I'll give Rudy the pass on that. I gotta you know? get a pin or something. I gotta, gotta get like yeah. a lapel pin or something. Yeah. I mean, Adrian's wear, digging it out. Like it's, uh, <laughs> the, the, well, because, uh, it's underneath my shirt. I have it okay, under good. my uh, under yeah, my my it's undershirt. Yeah. Oh, it's under your yeah. head. Well, you were talking about uh, the dress code in the Senate or in Congress or whatever, and, you know, that's something that's really gone by the wayside. A dress code what? You know, I mean, I can wear a hoodie, the gas man hoodie. I can wear stuff like that. Anything goes these days. But I think we need to get back to uh, a dress code (laughs) and enforce the dress code, you know, or something like that. But it it is something. But I'm sure with your ladies group that you spoke to, uh, Adrian, Um, you know, the eyes get, you know, you raise the eyebrows when you talk about dress because it's important. It really is. It's, we don't talk about it enough. Um, but I I do see lots of fashion disasters every time I step out (laughs) into the world. So uh, God help us. God help us. I was surprised. I was happily surprised that no, nobody got mad at me. Uh, none of the ladies got upset with me. Not yet. Uh, not yet. Yeah. Maybe I'll get emails later. But uh, they, I got a few people who were like, "Oh yeah, that was great. That was wonderful." Um, but uh, yeah, I was uh, I was a little worried that I was gonna get lynched. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, when you talk about when you talk about modesty and you talk about dress, people get very angry. People get very upset. Um, yeah, it's just uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, you don't want to touch that one with a ten foot pole. That's the one you don't want to say to a, to a group of women. Uh, people get very very angry. So, but nonetheless, 
it happened and i i said it and one of the things i said was um <laughs> i say you know okay we, the holy scripture says men should not dress like women and everybody agrees right everybody's like yeah all good catholics all good christians all people of sane mind like yeah we totally agree 100 percent don't wear uh, women men should not be wearing dresses shouldn't be wearing skirts it's uh, that's not appropriate drag queens bad um but then you say re- keep reading though and the rest of the passage says women should not dress like men and they're like oh what does that mean oh but no women don't wear men's clothing wait what's men's clothing pants a jacket all these things we the women wear men's clothing all the time it's completely normalized completely normalized that women wear men's clothing absolutely 100 percent normalized and uh and so that's i i so i just told them i told them that and then i said um and i'm just gonna leave y'all with this if holy scripture says women should not wear men's clothing what do you think god meant by that what would qualify as women wearing men's clothing just meditate on that uh and i just left it at that i was like i'm not gonna not gonna hammer that point <laughs> Adrian, you, you you start riots all the time. I you know this is. Do you 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 guys built a new studio with security? I know that's why you did the renovation. You just wanted to make sure that you had that safe haven. You know that's really what it is. The, we got a double locks, yeah. um, double the steel locks, doors yeah. that come down whenever the show starts, so no one can't kind of come after me during the show. It's, yeah. it's, it's a horror deal. Know, yeah, but again, my my sympathies to the women. Uh, in trying to buy clothing that is modest. My oh, good wife has told me many times, you go try to buy a long skirt today. See if you can find one nope. in the store. No. I mean, you go try to find a, a top that will have longer sleeves and all thing. Uh, nope. You know, like as you say. So um, I tell you, the, the car, the, what do you say? It's against, it's against them. I mean, you almost have to go back to the days where you made your own clothes. Um, that's what I remember growing up and my, my aunts and my mother, they were always making clothes. Uh, they had patterns and they'd make the long skirts for my sisters and the blouses that weren't revealing. So, uh, we got to go back to that cottage industry of making our own clothes and, uh, doing that. I don't know, but my sympathies to the ladies, it is difficult to buy the nice stuff, the, yeah. the modest stuff. If, yeah. Yeah, I'm so. glad you mentioned that. You know, uh, us particularly, my wife, uh, she keeps the Mormons busy. <laughs> They're yeah. like the only <laughs> ones who make the, the modest clothes. So, yeah. but uh, that's wow. just because we don't have time to make our own clothes. Uh, otherwise, I, I totally would. I would make my own clothes if I could. Uh, Brooke Sturham in the chat says, "Sounds like a good business idea." Then, yeah, absolutely. It is a hundred percent a. I think so too. That's a cash cow waiting to happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Craig says, it never fails when I need a quick answer. Then the other person wants to tell me their life story. Texting gives me control. <laughs> the thing talking about technology. Um, let's see. Jane says, what about in church? Mini skirts, leggings. Yeah, that's even worse. I'm talking about like in general, but the church is even like another, just another degree. Like the whole idea of Sunday best doesn't even exist anymore. I'm going to uh, send this, uh, this reel to, uh, to Taylor and I'm going to see if he can play it on our, uh, our feed. I like okay. talking. And Sonia says, yes, Adrian is trouble. Uh, it says, <laughs> it says Sonia. Yeah, Alan, um, one of my friends was like, um, Adrian, you're going to a mom's group. You should uh, plug that you're, uh, that you're single and you're uh, 25 and see if they have any uh, daughters or, or friends or, or little sisters. And I was like, mm, after giving my talk, I don't think they're going <laughs> to, I don't think that it's a, it's a great idea to be, to say that. I think they're going to be like, um, yeah, I totally uh, do not want to set my uh, the Adrian up with anybody. And I was like, yeah, no thank you. No thanks. Pass. Yeah, You need to send a fleece to the Lord or something like that to say, Lord, send me a girl at Taco Bell who's wearing a miraculous medal. <laughs> and that's the girl I'm going to marry. Like, did, you know, I, I'm starting to do more of that. Lord, I, like, I put up a, I don't know if this is the right terminology, but a fleece or, like, um, or something where you're saying to the Lord, okay, if you really want me to do this or not do this, make this happen or give me a sign. So you got to put that up and say, yeah, a uh, girl at Taco Bell <laughs> wearing a miraculous medal or something Culver's. like that. So, um, yeah. Hey, so, hey, you know. If, if uh, Rudy and I, if we uh, go to Culver's today and there's a girl 
with a miraculous medal, I'm just going to propose to her on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, just just say. You know, no, I'm just joking. Could you just say I'm a I'm I'm a radio announcer. Would you please listen to me tomorrow and uh, you know help support me or whatever? So that would be hilarious. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It's all good. It's all good. I think. Um, you know? I think. Uh, I think Taylor is. Taylor is that. Yeah, he's got that. Oh, yeah. So this is a reel about what the the saints would wear. Yeah, Taylor, you can play that. Uh, I don't uh, think we can see not, it. Yeah. yeah. You, <coughs> start that over, Taylor. Hey, you, um, you switched over to Alan, and so we weren't watching that. We were just hearing nice music. Uh, so let's try that again. Let's see, see if we can do that again. Let's see. The All right. Uh, let us know whenever that gets, that gets set up. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, just hop on the mic whenever you get it set. For now, you can switch the camera over to me, uh, Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> no, hey, wait. There you go. There you go. Yeah, okay. yeah, when you get it set up, just hop on the mic and let us know. Uh, let's see. Tammy says, as a slightly plus size woman due to medical issues, it's really hard to find clothes that are not revealing or tacky. I'm going to start making my own clothes as soon as I can. Yeah, my, my, um, my sister started making her own clothes. Uh, that is and, so cool. Yeah. Yeah, Emily, That's my little awesome. sister, she makes her own clothes. Um, yeah, so it's she's she's just she's really cool. My sister is pretty cool. Let's see, you got it. All right, go ahead, play it. Forget it. Oh, well. Forget it. We'll put it in the television. Yeah, again. we'll send it in the chat. <laughs> I was like, I was watching it, and I'm like, I don't think it's playing. Oh goodness. Yeah. Oh well. Oh well. Well, it, it is very beautiful sound, isn't it? It is Paul? very nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're over here grooving too. Yeah. I'm like, well, I'm like looking. I'm like, is there a delay? I'm like, no. I'm looking at myself, not talking. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> all right. Let's see. Uh, White Wolf said, "Take care. God bless you all." Signing out. All right. God bless uh, White Wolf. Anyway, in this video, there's this really interesting um, uh, photograph of what Saint Gemma would wear, and it was a very beautiful, simple. And there's so much beauty in simplicity. It's a very simple black dress with a cape, a black cape, without any decor, and she would wear a black straw hat. I mean, that, that's amazing. It's modest. It's beautiful. It's. I mean, what else can you ask for? Hmm. Yeah, the the clothing of the saints. My little sister, she would um, she would dress that like um, like some of these images that you see here. And uh, we actually, she was in this particular dress, and um, I was like, Emily, you look just like Saint Gemma. And she was wearing the the black with the um, long sleeves, the skirt that goes down. And I was like, wow, that's very interesting way um, the saints dressed yeah it's pretty cool the quality of the materials too that they would use Ugh. yeah they don't so do that cool. anymore and none of that is none of that is used anymore alan did you sell the devil's fabric did you sell polyester, polyester? no that that was um Forbode. i think that was actually um Band. I don't know. I, I, really? I made sure. Well, I well, I always worked at high end clothing stores. Nice. Um, you know, um, it's it just one of these things where everything was. Um, you came in for a suit, and we we'd almost you know c customize. If here's the fabric. Here's this. I mean, there was stuff wow. that were off the ra off the rack, but um, again, it was all high quality. You know, Harry Rosen. Um, you know, it's it's this stuff like, you know, I guess in Toronto. Because it was from the big city, you know, there was places that people would go to the fashion district and they'd say, hey, I'm going, I'm driving. And guys, the businessmen would say, I need these suits and those, these accessories. Um, it, it's amazing back then, of course, the dress code was high. I mean, I, I grew up where you never, ever thought of not wearing a tie and jacket to work. Mm. I mean, you wore a suit and tie every day. Um, it wasn't until I was, you know, 
you know, 40 years old that they started to allow for a kind of a lax Friday, um, you know, I don't know whatever they call it, but on Friday you could dress down slightly in mm -hmm. that you could take your tie off, but that was it. And I do remember being reprimanded once. Um, uh, I was a, a manufacturer sales rep and I was making a visit to uh, a large corporation and I didn't have my suit jacket on. I just had my t shirt and tie. And the one manager that uh, was running the meeting came to me and said, uh, listen, never do that again. Don't come in <laughs> casual. <laughs> like, you know, and so back then there was that awesome. standard that was uh, maintained. So wow. uh, we need a little bit more of that. So we, you, we yeah. get the exact opposite now. I went to an event one time and I won't call anybody out, but they were like, Adrian, are you going to wear that the whole time here? I was like, um, yes. I was like, you could take your tie off. I was like, um, no, it's okay. I'm okay. It's not, it doesn't bother me. No, okay. And I was, uh, immediately I was thinking about that quote from Professor Plinio that I was reading earlier, where he's like, yeah, there's uh, the vulgar man will see you in a suit and tie and be like, why don't you just take that tie off? Why, why don't you take that jacket off? Uh, let's see. Sonia said, I've seen pictures of my great grandmother and their dresses full body, long sleeves all the time, long skirts, mostly only one color, either black or gray. Almost a turtleneck type style still and over it. They always had an apron on. Even their shoes were little black lace up boots. They were designed to make their dresses uh, tomb. I don't know if that was a typo. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's um, amazing. We, we, I love it. I love it. Uh, color is good. Color is good. But if you can't afford color, obviously, back then, a color was ex more expensive in the past. Uh, Jane says, Adrian, what about your sister's friends? I married my brother's friend. Um, my sister, My sister doesn't, doesn't have, have friends. friends. <laughs> oh, come on. Are you serious? No way, dude. Now I almost, I'm almost tempted to say we have to go to Culver's to see yeah, if there's got, a woman dude, we have to go to Culver's. wearing a miraculous, miraculous medal. medal. It's gonna oh, wait. Did, I think Alan said it had to be Taco Bell, though. Yeah, but we're changing it to Culver's. Taco Bell. Yeah, okay. Cool. Well, you can change it, yeah, but same. I'm just saying. Taco Bell. <laughs> Taco Bell. <laughs> we'll go to both. Let's talk about both. I'm gonna go. To, I'm gonna go to Taco Bell today when I'm in America, <laughs> and, oh, nice. and look because the the menu at Taco Bell in America is an expanded menu. In Canada, really? they partner with Kentucky Fried Chicken and Taco Bell, so you don't get the full uh, enchilada. Alan, you don't get the full uh, thing. So, Alan, you got it. You got to get the app and order a quesarito. You'll thank <laughs> okay. me later. Thank me later. Okay, quesarito. Okay. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I think the steak one is superior, but I don't know. Sonia said, uh, there he goes, that mischievous laugh, Adrian. Yeah, I mean, it's not my <laughs> fault. And my, my sister's, most of my sister's friends are like my friend's wives and the things like that. So, I mean, it, it's kind of a thing. Uh, so <laughs> it's kind of difficult. Uh, maybe she does have friends that I just don't know about. I don't know. Craig says, are we going to get a finder's fee? If Alan goes to Taco yes. Bell and finds somebody and I end up marrying them, he will get a finder's How fee. How funny would it be he if he's fee. the one who sees her? <laughs> Alan, report to us. Yeah. I will. I, I've got my, I got my phone. I'll be taking pictures. Who are you taking a picture of me for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, All right, Alan. God bless you. Yeah. Thank you for we'll joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you.